Hey, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, okay, myself, Sham, Sham Shashi. I currently work with uh, Carousel. So I will be completing uh, two years with Carousel next month. So I'm also a corp team member at Takila. So if you don't know what Takila is, it stands for Test Automation and Quality Engineering Lab. So we got this new name last month, not last month, uh, last year. Uh, from Singapore RPM Meetup. Um, from India, from the state uh, Kerala. So, if you are planning to uh, go for your next trip, I suggest you just go to Kerala. It has got everything for you. It's a seaside state and green carpet, hilly areas, waterfalls, sculpture, heritage, monuments, everything you got there. So, I strongly suggest to go there okay so I personally I want to dedicate uh, this talk to Mr. John Adalips I had a chance to meet him uh, during the last OSCON conference uh, I asked a lot of uh, stupid questions to him and he was very uh, kind and answered all the questions that I asked him and he even uh, gave us a uh, video testimony in our last uh, uh, first year celebration. So almost all the um, tips that I took it from his uh, a weekly APM newsletter called APM Pro. So if you have been subscribed to that, I suggest, uh, I highly recommend that one. You go and subscribe that. You get a lot of tips from that newsletter. So uh, let me ask one thing. How many of you are using APM in your project or office? OK, cool. Most of them haven't. Uh, nice. So, uh, APM, um, basically it is using for the mobile uh, test automation, mobile apps, automating the mobile applications. So, it supports, uh, supports a number of uh, programming languages and uh, it's the most uh, preferred automation te testing tool across the world for the uh, mobile application testing. So uh, I won't be uh, focusing much on the uh, beginning levels. So basically, I want to give you some tips on that one, how some small tips on how you can effectively use APM. Uh, the first one, how to inspect the elements. So um, the most preferred uh, tool for inspecting is the APM desktop. This is the official uh, app that APM suggests. So there are around 30 contributors there already there. So if you look at Makkaka.js, it's a web-based uh, tool where y you can use that one and you can hi uh, hit an URL so the mobile CV will be displayed on displayed on a, a web page. Uh, and there are APM IOS inspector also. So personally, I prefer to use APM desktop over the other tools, which is highly stable now. Um, second one. How can you uh, check some network conditions? So there are situations where you need to test your app on multiple network conditions, like uh, what happens if you uh, turn on the flight mode, and obviously uh, the internet will be cut off, and what will happen to the application that you are testing on? So if you want to test something like this, uh, methods are useful, like toggle airplane mode. If you want to toggle data, there are toggle data commands. If you want to toggle Wi-Fi, there are toggle Wi-Fi commands. Uh, the first three, uh, specifically for Android emulators, basically if you want to send an SMS on Android, you can call these commands like send SMS. So it will do a fake SMS, like make a GSM call, or how, how much signal strength you want to emulate on an emulator, so like thing we can do. So if you have test cases related to the location, you can use the final one like set location. So basically, it's a uh, longitude, altitude, all this information you need to give in when you start the new location class. Desktop app. Uh, OK. So APM can be used for desktop application as well. So I have a small demo for it. It's quite interesting. So you can use APM for both 
Mac machines as well as Windows machine. Uh, I won't be able to do a demo on WinApp uh, using WinApp driver. I can do a demo on Mac. So uh, how does it work like there is a hmm, tool called APM, APM for Mac. So you need to install this app first. Then if you want to do like how you get the accessibility ID or any other locator strategy, you want to get the uh, element location of location strategy for a particular element, what you can do, you just point towards uh, whatever with the ins element you want to inspect and click the function, the function key. So you can see that the APM desktop actually jumping. Then you just go to any notepad and just paste it. So uh, that particular location, let me zoom in. Mm, I cannot zoom in, sorry. So uh, that particular uh, expression is called AX path. So that particular AX path expression being captured and uh, you can just use this as a web elements locator strategy and you can instantiate a web driver and you can do whatever be the things with it. So we can see a demo. Okay, so um, I have this test case. So the first thing is you need to start the APM server. Let me close this. So when you run this command, the APM server will be starting on the default port 4723. And what you can do, let's say, when I set the capabilities, I'm giving platform name as Mac and device name as Mac. What I'm going to do, uh, there is an application in Mac called Activity Monitor. So this is the app, Activity Monitor. So I am going to open this process. And I'm going to click on all these tabs. And I'm going to do a search. And I'm validating the search result. So I have already captured the uh, locator, locator strategies. So what I'm going to do? Uh, I set the app as activity monitor. Then once I open that one, then I'm going to click on uh, this memory, energy, disk, CPU, network tabs. I'm going to search node um, and I'm verifying that particular node is being displayed over there. So let me run this one. searching node and then it's verified the node result over here. So if you have a scenario would like you need to automate the Mac apps, it's very uh, highly helpful. So like this, uh, there is something called WinApp driver for Windows where you can use it. So in order to inspect elements, uh, they're providing, uh, it's from Microsoft. So they're providing uh, something called inspector.exe. So using inspector.exe, just like the AX path, you can identify the elements in the Windows machine and you can just instantiate the WinApp driver and start using it. Cool. Next one. Uh, which locator strategy should I select when I start automating? So if you compare it with Selenium, APM is an extension uh, of Selenium. So you can see that class name, ID, name, XBath, which uh, supports in APM as well. So APM specific locator strategy, there are accessibility IDs. Uh, for iOS, there are predicative string and class chains. Android, there are UI automator. Uh, the UI automation is deprecated from uh, Xcode 8 onwards. So the other stuff like link test, those are uh, not available with uh, APM. It's available only with Selenium. So what should be my priority like uh, when I select the locator strategy for the particular element? The first preference goes for the accessibility ID. So if an element has accessibility ID, you should always use that one. You shouldn't select any of the other one. This is for iOS. If there is no accessibility IDs there, 
uh, there could be cases where elements don't have accessibility id like especially uh, some qa teams are not lucky enough to sit along with the dev team but the dev team may be in another location or uh, the team qa team is simply handling the testing the development has been done by some other other companies there are so many scenarios are there so uh, in that case if there is no accessibility id uh, the first preference should be go for ns predicates so ns predicates something like um, it's like xpath but in a better transform which the xeua test understands for example uh, if you want to check the uh, label as olivia in a table this is the corresponding expression for that one so class 10 also there class 10 is also something similar like xpath but much faster than xpath Android, if, okay, the first preference goes for the accessibility ID again. It's called a resource ID or content description in Android. If there is no content description in Android, you should go for, you can use the latest one, UA selector. So UA selector is very helpful to identify the elements based on uh, what text view or any other properties that uh, Android provide. So uh, my point is that Try to not use XPath. Avoid XPath if you can. Uh, but it's not really possible to avoid XPath 100%. There are cases, but if you have a chance to use other locator strategies, just go for it. Because XPath, it will work. Your test will work, of course, but it's time consuming. And it's very expensive for RPM to deal with it. Especially, I have seen people write long XPath chains, and in an another update, everything gonna fail yeah so try to avoid this one always use the first preference goes for accessibility id and for ios the second preference is I, uh, predicate strings and you automator for android uh, this might or uh, this might be uh, familiar for everyone so i think everyone is using in all the project irrespective of uh, selenium or rpm weights so how do you wait for an element to appear on the screen? When I started my career, I was heavily using the static ways, like hundreds of thread dot sleep in my projects. And it was working fine on my machine, and the moment when you run on any other machine, it's began to fail, especially when low, uh, there is no internet speed, uh, so many other reasons. So try to avoid the static weights, like thread dot sleep, 30 seconds, or uh, three seconds. So what will happen, uh, the login screen appear after the third second, in the fourth second. Obviously, it's going to fail, right? The second one, implicit wait. So uh, I have seen that people are just using the implicit wait when you instantiate the driver and just expecting that it will be working fine. It's not the case. So if you instantiate the implicit wait like this, it means that all the for all the elements, by default, it will wait for 10 seconds for, from this example. But it should be more dynamic. There are cases like uh, maybe a new page takes more than 10 seconds to load. So you need to write the custom or not custom uh, explicit wait for that one. So explicit wait is more dynamic to use. So basically, you can tell that there is a web driver wait and you can wait until an expected condition met. Like there are a lot of conditions like presence of element located, uh, is element visible, is element cl clickable, or something like that. So uh, there are custom uh, weights you can write. There is an uh, apply method over there. If you override that apply method with explicit weight, you can have your own custom, uh, custom conditions. Like, you can wait till it's visible and it's clickable. So both condition you can club together. So uh, such things are possible. Uh, okay, I didn't add one more wait. Anyone familiar of any other kind of wait in Selenium? Yes. Any idea what that is? Exactly. So basically, uh, the, the explicit weight means that uh, by default, mm, it will query for the element within 500 milliseconds or something like that. Okay. So with the fluent weight, you can control uh, within whatever be the time interval you you are polling that element. So which will be more dynamic. So there is a fluent weight also. So sim similar like the explicit weight. 
Dealing with an element when visibility is false, yes. Yes, I recommend strongly recommend to use the explicit weight. Yes. Okay, what happens when visibility of an element is false? So I have seen this issue mostly in iOS. Element is uh, visible on the page for human eyes, but if you check the property, it's false. Anyone made this issue before? When the visibility property is false for an element, but it's still showing on the UI. Yes. So uh, there is a workaround for it. So what do you need to do? Uh, the element still won't be uh, null. So what you can do, you can click using the coordinates. So if you call the click command using a PM, it means that it by default it checks for the visibility. But if you click using the coordinates, it's never checked for checks for the visibility. So you can find out the middle x, y coordinates of that particular element, and you can click on it. So basically, it's quite simple. So let's say uh, I find my element ref, then I get the uh, middle x and middle y points of that element, then. I find out uh, exact point point where I need to click, maybe the middle portion. Then I do the actions to click on it. Uh, no, uh, it's not sensitive because this is uh, the x y coordinates. We are not hard coding. So if you look at the code, we are finding out the exact middle point based on the total width and height of that particular element. So if you are testing this on different screen size devices, the x, y coordinates also vary accordingly. So it's more dynamic. But if you are hard coding this, then there is a high chance that the test can be breaking, uh, breaking in other devices. So by going this method, it, that can be omitted. Cool? Speeding up your tests. Oh, this is my favorite portion. Deep links. Anyone try deep links in your automation framework? OK, so let me uh, tell an example. Um, OK, just forget about the user sign up flow. If you have an application, uh, obviously, you will have a login flow, right? So in order to test any other uh, functionalities, the first steps you need to do, login. Imagine um, the login takes 20 seconds to complete, including uh, typing the username, typing the password, click on the login button, and go to home page. Maybe you have automated 50 test cases. So this login functionality takes every time 20 seconds. So 50 into 20, that much seconds, almost 15 to 20, 20 minutes for an entire regression test you, that you are wasting. The question is, can we bypass the login so that I can, if I specify the username and password in a PM, the moment when I start the app, can I directly go to the home page so that you can save this 20 seconds for each test case? Yes, it's possible. So basically, what you need to do, you need to create a deep link in your application. So deep links are nothing but it's a special URI schemes and providing that when the app uh, get a request for this URI, it means that it understands that app need to navigate to the home page. So for example, uh, the app, login, auth, auth user, auth password, I am passing the credentials over there. So when you call driver.get method, instead of going to the login screen, the app will directly go to the home page. So we completely bypass it. We can see a demo. So we have this uh, demo from Appium Pro. Cool. So uh, first, I will show you the normal flow, like uh, the user login using clicking or uh, entering the username and password and clicking on the login and go to home page. OK, so I am running on one of the I.O. simulator.
yeah so enter username password click on login yeah basically it wait for the presence of element so it passed next what if if we can skip the login so what i'm going to do uh, here I'm calling the deep link here and passing the username and password. So let's do it. Yeah, basically, I need to wait here a bit to see that happened but basically it passed <laughs> yeah better so uh, I have a check here like uh, get logged by you logged and basically check accessibility ID found basically it means that it passed so there won't be any uh, username input actions that are happening over there another method is uh, the process arguments capability in appm so what you can do, you can call something called uh, optional intent uh, intent arg argument. I think the spelling is wrong here. Yeah. Optional intent arguments. And uh, uh, likewise, you do with the deep links. You can pass the username and password. So for this, I have a carousel example over here. Uh, it's quite uh, similar. So, what are you going to do? Like, I have a capability setting, process arguments, and I am passing the argument over here as a username and password. So, let me run the first one. Uh, this is without process argument, the normal flow. So it's clicking on the um, yep. so I'm stopping till uh, when I see the notify me button found. So we do the same for indent arguments. So it's uninstalling the app and testing again. Yeah, so basically it's skipping that part, directly going to the home page. So if you are really considering about uh, saving some time in your automation flow, consider implementing deep links and optional intent arguments. Yeah, so next one, uh, some uh, useful capabilities that APM provides. Oh, these are three are cross platforms like uh, no reset, full reset, everyone might have familiar, right? So if you're giving no reset, it means that uh, app will not be uninstalled. Full request, request means that uh, app will be un uninstalled and reinstalled every time when you run the test. So if you're not, if, you, if you're gonna uh, disable the full reset, it means that uh, you can save the time by not installing it over and over again. So you can save some time. Ease headless uh, is a new capability, so which means that um, you can run the simulators on emulators in headless mode. So there won't be anything showing on the UI, but you can still hear the sounds. It won't be like the uh, HTML unit driver or something like that. It's like uh, the UI won't be rendered on the screen. So um, it, if you, in terms of performance uh, perspective, that saves some time. So if you are, if you have a simulators running in your uh, automation framework, consider using the ease headless true capability. Yes. Uh, no, not exactly, but uh, it's very few. I did a small test, then one or two seconds, one or two seconds for a single test. Yes. Um, 
Android one, uh, these are some useful one for Android. So disable Android watches, so what it will do, there is some process running on uh, whether there is a crash or some other stuff going on. So you can disable it using that capability, so which will boost some performance. The another one, auto grant permissions, so uh, which means that um, Appium will automatically accept all the allow, allow pop-up by the Android, so everything will be certified to true. You don't need to handle these pop-ups. Skip unlock, uh, so if you have an unlock on the, not the, I'm talking about the Appium unlock thing, and not the your screen, guard, screen, uh, screen specific lock. So if you want to skip Appium specific lock, you can just pass that skip unlock. Ignore unimportant views also, uh, it will, uh, it won't select the, uh, some of the views which is not really used for the test. So by default, it will fetch all the hierarchy. So if you are enabling this ignore unimportant views, it will, it, or not all the screens will be loaded, only that specific testable areas will be loaded. For iOS, um, use pre-built WA and derive it data path together. So, uh, what happens in iOS is that when you start a run, so web driver agent will uh, installing on the phone or simulator, and it will kickstart the testing. So, every time uh, it will build the web driver agent from the Xcode when you start it. So. If you have a pre-built WDA agent, you can use this one. You can give the path to that particular file. So every time Xcode command will not be running. So it will reuse the existing WDA, and you can get all the uh, test passed. So use JSON source. So uh, it's like retaining the JSON instead of XML, especially for some large applications. Uh, it will take too much time to retain the XML corresponding XML structure of the screen. So if you are using this one, instead of XML, Appium will consider using JSON, which will be much more faster than XML. I use install post. Uh, so once the web driver agent has started, um, Appium again checks whether the, uh, what's the right time to start the kickstart, the launch the application. So if you think, uh, in some of the phones or simulators, sometimes the installation fails. It because uh, RPM thinks that the process got over and it will try to launch the application even before the installation completes. So you can specify how many seconds you want to wait after the web driver agent instantiation. So if you're giving that one, so after that patch, seconds only, the next process will start, which will be much more stable. Max typing frequency, uh, basically it's the speed which uh, Appium types on the keyboard. So you can control by default, I think it's 60, so you can increase it or decrease it based on your requirement, which will be means that the typing speed will be slower or faster. Real device screen shorter, yeah. So if you are taking a screenshot on a real device, it's always buggy sometimes. Uh, I mean, it's always buggy, not sometimes. Uh, so instead of real device screen shorter, uh, it, it, I mean, if you are enabling this one, uh, Appium will use uh, ID based screenshot library, which will be much more stable. It will ignore the default screenshot library from Appium. Simple is visible check true. Yeah, so checking element is whether true or not, the default library is sometimes uh, it may fail. So if you are enabling this one, so which will be much more uh, better logic in this uh, particular section. So try to make it enable as true and you will get much more ease visible check happening or IPM in iOS. Okay. Next one, um, testing app upgrades. How many of you test app upgrades in automation testing? Let's say you have a release today, okay. So you need to make sure that uh, when users get the current release from the previous one, what they're gonna do, like most of the time, uh, you get a new update when you connect the charger, your phone, and plus to from Play Store, it will be automatically updated, right? They are not doing a fresh install, they are updating it, which means that if you already logged in, when you update the app, 
all your data should be there nothing should be lost okay so how can you do this scenario with apm because the current one we have seen that it will always uninstall and reinstall the app right so how can you really update an app i mean upgrade testing yeah it's quite easy in android so there is something called start activity so if you call that start activity then uh, the corresponding uh, app will be launched so in tops ios what you need to do you need to do a couple of uh, extra steps like there is a mobile terminate app then install uh, app sorry app uh, this one the version of the app to be updated you need to give the give that one basically another ip file or app file then you need to call the install app and launch app which means that if you calling this then none of your data will be lost you will be st still logged into the application and you can see all the existing data so to test basically you need two different uh, files to be installed one with the older version one with the latest version and first you need to install the older version and start using this command for the lat latest one to be installed switching between the apps so um earlier uh, it was not possible to get a, a different screen other than what you have tested in iOS but it's now possible you can switch to different screens now android again it's easy you just start the activity of the application that to be instantiated it will be uh, started even though you are testing the current app on ios uh, for example let's say i am on the uh, gallery page so mobile launch that particular one um if you want to activate another app you can call mobile activate app so which means that what will be the installed app on your phone and you call that particular app it will be open on the top of the gallery page so it's quite straightforward earlier this feature was not available in iOS but it was there in android testing the push notifications okay i don't i really wanted to do a demo but i don't know have a backend uh, service to enable the push notification but the logic is very simple for android it's again straightforward you just call open notifications you get it as a list all the available uh, notification on the screen for ios what you need to do uh, you need to scroll down from the top temp top top to the mid of the screen then it will open the open notification session you need to click on the open notification so all the push notification that you have received will be available on that side and you can verify that yeah so basically you need to call the terminate app and activate app again so basically it's same as just killing the current process go to the push notification and getting it get in the app back customer alerts so uh there the earlier um, alerts were like accept alert and decline a dismiss alert that that was the only few uh, two methods were available in apm but what happens there are multiple buttons on the alert like okay a noter yeah i want to do something else so more than decline and accept so in that case what you can do you can get all the button labels from an existing alert and you can click on that particular alert so it means that uh, let's say i have a uh, action called sorry get buttons so if you pass that one i will be getting all the alert on as a list on buttons then you need to iterate this list and you can you can have a custom code like whether it has okay or cancel button or whatever be the uh, label that on that particular button and you can click on that one so again on clicking so you can do something like accept on as as the action you can put accept and you can click on it so logic is simple like get all the buttons and what will be the button that you want to click click on it using the accept argument find element using image so basically internally this use a open cv library so uh what you can do it's quite 
straightforward. Uh, the only precondition is that uh, you need the image should be in the base64 format. So you can call this base64 code. Then uh, you can set up the threshold level, like uh, how many percentage of matching you want to meet with the given image. And you can click on it. There is an uh, uh, presence of element located by image or driver dot find using image command is there. So it will return the corresponding image. So what it will do, it will take the current screen screenshot, screenshot of the current cu current device. And whatever be the element that you are passing, it will try to find a match on the current screen and it will return it. Picker wheel. I think someone asked, is it you, Tursa? Oh, yeah. You pinged me earlier, right? So she asked me a couple of months back, like, how to automate a picker wheel. I didn't know that that time, but uh, now I know. So it's easy. Just use send keys. Yes. So that particular, uh, basically, it <laughs> are you swiping now? Are you swiping on? OK. <laughs> so it's more easy. Basically, it will work like a text field. So you can, if you know which value to be selected, you can pass send keys. So that particular value will be selected. But there are cases where you are not aware of the value to be selected. In that case, you can use the other one, like, like select picker wheel value argument. So it, it need three uh, op uh, three arguments, like on which direction you want to scroll, like next or previous. What's the offset that you want to swipe? Then ID of the picker element. So if you pass this one and you pass the parameters, it will be picked on not key. We can show a demo. So uh, not this one, picker wheel, yay. Let me run this one. So I am uh, selecting March 6th as a send keys. Then using the other options, what I'm going to do, I'm going to select the past the next and get the first element that has been displayed over there. And again, I am uh, doing the selecting the picker wheel in the opposite direction using the previous. So let me run it. So if you are uh, stopped, if you stopped automating any functionality just because of picker wheel, just use this one. You are able to automate that. Starting. Yep, March. Okay, six is not selected. Good. I think there are some issue with selecting that one. We're supposed to select the uh, five instead of six. I need to find out why. Sorry. Uh, but that's basically that's how it works. Uh, label. Th this one. Oh, send keys, right? It's the it it could be uh, basically this picker element, right? <coughs> basically, I'm um, getting it by the picker. So. There is a class name for that one picker wheel or something. In this example, we are using. But if you have an accessibility ID for that particular picker wheel, uh, best uh, the better you just do it using that one accessibility ID. Cool. Next one, uh, video recording. I this is a much needed. Uh, uh, functionality, especially if you have an in-house uh, device form or something. So uh, again, it's quite handy. For example, in this example, we use the uh, iOS again. So the first thing you need to do, you need to give the iOS start screen recording options. And you can specify the quality of the video you want. 
and in how many uh, seconds of duration maximum you need for that particular recording. Then you can uh, start recording by calling start recording method. Then you pass the options, all the recording options over there. Then same for the stop recording. You can just call the stop recording. So once you call the stop recording, it will return to a string. So you need to convert this. You need to uh, decode this string to byte and just uh, write the file used from this byte. So if you look at this uh, record record string, it's going to be like uh, it just look like a encrypted format. So you need to decode that using base64 and you using the uh, files, Java files, you can just write it. Again, we can just use that picker wheel demo. So I have already run this, so let me delete this. And I'm running it again. Yeah, now it's selected six. <laughs> cool. It passed. And if you look at the, yeah, it came back again. So. Go here. And open this one. Come on, come on. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All the screen action has been recorded and we successfully write into a file. If you are planning to uh, do it in your automation framework along with your HTML report, this is uh, highly recommended. Especially uh, if you want to check why the test case has been finished or failed. OK, uh, parallel and distributed testing. This is a very vast uh, big topic. But uh, we will give an overview on how it's possible to do parallel and distributed testing with APM. So there are four ways. The first one, you can run multiple APM servers and sending one session to each server, which means that uh, I can run multiple uh, PM on different ports, like 4723, 4724, and just give that particular path to the driver, and it will be instantiated. Second one, run only single APM server and sending multiple sessions to it. That also possible. So uh, you don't need to run multiple APM servers. You can always point towards the single APM server that has been running, and still it works. APM handles it. And then third one, uh, one or more APM servers behind a grid and sending all session to the grid hub. So you can reuse the Selenium grid and register the APM as a node over there, and you can start using it. The fourth one is uh, using a cloud solution. So there are so many uh, cloud providing companies are there for automation. You can reuse that one. So let me uh, do a quick uh, demo on the grid. Yep. OK. So uh, here, what we're going to do I have these three commands. The first one is I need to start a grid hub. OK, so um, let me open three tabs. I'm going to this folder where my uh, 
Java standalone server jarries, then I'm starting the grid on port the port 4443. So what will happen now? So hub has been started successfully and if you go to this URL, you can see that it's running. Yeah. So if you go to the console, no node has been registered yet, so it's empty there. So how you can register an RPM node over here? So RPM provides something called uh, node config capability. So Let me open it. So I have two JSON files. The first one, yep. Okay, let me open it in another. Okay, cool. So uh, there are some capabilities that I have provided here and the configuration also. So in the configuration, I have given that which URL, in which URL the hub is running, I am specifying here. And this is the IP address. And this is a port where the RPM node should be running. This is a hub port. And this is a hub host. So the capabilities I have provided like uh, the name, browser name basically, it's same as the simulator name. And uh, device name is almost same as the uh, same as UDID. Then UDID also is given. Uh, this one is not needed. Then WDA local port. If you want, you can specify. Then uh, platform name also. So, if you run this, the corresponding node will be registered to the grid. So let me run the first one. So the command is apm hyphen hyphen node config, just give the JSON file. And the apm will be trying to register that particular node on the grid. So interface has been started. Yeah, apm successfully registered with on the grid, the URL of the grid. So if you go here, if you refresh, you can see that it has been came here. So with all the configuration that we have provided. So likewise, uh, what we're going to do, we're going to register one more simulator. Yep. So the second node also been registered. So if you refresh this page, you can see that there are two nodes are running. So it could be another machine. So it need not be the same machine. If you if you run this command from another machine, which is in the same internet, which is accessible to the hub, it will be registered out there. <coughs> so the first one is sorry. Mm. This is iPhone 5s, and this is iPhone 6. So how can we st start using it? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to pass this UDID as a capability. Then I'm not specifying uh, any other thing other than the URL of the hub. So let me run this one. So we are again running the same uh, picker wheel. So you can see that this one came up and one simulator has started and it will be we will be running the test on that particular one. So basically if you look at iPhone fibers, it picked up a match on the registered node and if it is available it will be running over there. 
Likewise, you can uh, register Android One, even Chrome, Firefox, Internet Explorer, anything. And based on the request that we have given from the web driver, it will be picked up over here. It, if it is been already being used, then it will be go to the queue. And once the execution has been done on that particular node, it will be picked up from the queue. Yeah, it passed. Yeah, basically same for the other simulator. Yeah. Uh, Selenium Grid will uh, already handling that one, but you need to specify. If, okay, so what I have seen, like, let's say if you are not passing the UDID, and if it's not found a match on that particular uh, session. Sometimes it will throw uh, not found. I mean, the requested capability is not found. But again, if it matches the same device name, Appium will try to create a new simulator. So that's quite messy. So you need to control, always control the simulator with the UDID. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, in uh, web uh, web testing, it's possible. But in RPM, when you start the driver, right, the, especially on iOS, the device name capability is a mandatory one. So without device name, you cannot instantiate. So if you are providing that one, so RPM, if it's not found on that particular machine, RPM will try to create a new simulator based on whatever. If you look, go to the Xcode and check the simulator, you can see that a new simulator has been added by the RPM. So that part quite messy, and we need to solve it by using the UDIDs. But there are ways to use that one. Like you can check uh, the Selenium grid and check whether particular node is in use, or you can wait till that uh, wait for that time, or you, you you or you can even check what are the available nodes which are not being in use, and you can dynamically assign to that one. It's possible. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there are multiple ways, multiple workarounds. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, I think I'm done. There are some references. So almost 90% of what I have said is there in the APM Pro editions. And uh, there are another uh, great uh, references that from Srinivas. There is an awesome RPM GitHub. So almost everything related to RPM is over there on that page. You can check that one. Uh, there are some advanced concepts in the uh, GitHub RPM repo so also there. You can check the advanced concept. It's a documentation that maintained by the RPM team. It's also there. So if you have any questions, you can ask. Hello. Yeah. I think it's still same. Yeah. Anyway, so what I'm asking is, hmm. uh, which method you will prefer on doing parallel testing? Like you have mentioned different ways, right? Either by Selenium Grid or creating different server by command line or single ATM server by different session. Hmm. So I mean, which one we should use as new? If you have enough budget, I would suggest use a cloud provider. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> because uh, even though you are setting up all these things, the, you need to maintain that one, right? Yeah. So uh, and there are conditions like you cannot run your test on a cloud provider. In that case, obviously, you need to build a device from in your office. Or uh, ideally, uh, 
you should you need not run all the devices on all the devices for uh, i mean um, it depends on how you test the application like how frequently you are testing are you testing on all the pull request or are you testing only on the nightly build or something like that depends on various parameters um currently in carousel uh, we are using both cloud provider as well as the in house device farm based on based on the requirement that we got but obviously i won't be using the first one and two points different apm servers and so running on a single apm server thanks popular one the cloud provider aws or uh, any example okay so um, again uh, that really depend on your application your kind of application and what kind of testing you can do so all these uh, cloud provider uh, pro providers offer a different set of goals and different set of packages so you need to evaluate based on your requirement and you need to conclude so if uh, one company select one uh, cloud provider it doesn't mean that another one really it, it's a match for it, it's a exact match so it really depend on what you really need hi sham hey this is just in general question like uh, how carousel is like uh, integrating the automation with uh, jenkins and cdci oh okay uh, i mean uh, you, your question specific to apm how we are using apm uh, not just apm but uh, okay you can talk about apm but uh, in general like automation can be a web web automation also or can be a mobile <coughs> so um, currently uh, we have two types of uh, automation testing running in our project the first one is uh, nightly build so where we are testing the uh, nightly build and we will be running it um, on every ev every night and we get a result on the next day maybe even before when we come to office another one kind of things like the uh, pull request so basically it's like whenever developers are opening a pr so we are testing a sort of uh, subset of the or uh, sanity test out there for every pull request so we will be getting that corresponding um, build point to base that particular branch and we are downloading that one and we are testing that one yeah yeah so yes correct so basically for every every pr so we are uploading uh, the apk or ipa or app files to the common location and our automation script will be picking up that particular file and will be reused in our automation framework yeah. uh, okay so uh, your question is like uh, what happens when two peers comes at the same time obviously uh, we will run both at the same time that's why the selenium grid going to be handy out there yes um for selenium we have like the record and playback right so in a in appium there is does it have like that capability yes uh, with the latest version of appium desktop there is a record and playback so you can uh, if you using that one the corresponding location uh, thus i mean locators will be copied over there and you can convert it to any programming language that you need so there is a template over there you can select ruby java python so corresponding code will be generated yes anybody else that's it okay When I run my automation, it's actually not the test itself fail, but actually it's like wait for certain element and, and it doesn't appear. Like let's say a uh, soft keyboard, it doesn't mm. appear. That's why it was like stay down there. But actually the APM, or rather my test script is running bypass that, that stage already. Like let's say you are in the lock-in screen. So you are supposed to have a soft keyboard. Uh, 
uh, appear, but it doesn't appear due to some simulators that think. This is uh, spe especially happening on the simulators, right? Yeah. Okay. So, so, so in that case, it's like not it's not because of mm. my test case failing, but it's because of this. So, uh, how do you? It's still because of the test case. I mean, it's part of the test case. How it's you handle the, how you maintain the simulators, maintaining yeah, the yeah. test devices, everything part of the responsibility of the QA. Because I, uh, just now the question was asking about nightly. Yes. I was like, can't imagine if next time I'm going to use that as a nightly thing, then if this thing is going to occur, then the next morning I come in, I discover, actually, it never, never you run all my test cases, but actually it's the failure yeah. is due to this this issue uh, let's say um, if that issue happens okay it not going to be an intermittent issue so basically why that keyboard is not appearing on simulator it is because keyboard never appeared on that uh, that particular simulator or you are just used a new simulators right yeah. so basically uh, which means that the next day when you fix it the, the uh, ongoing so, so the test will be I, come, I realize my test case is not even running then yeah. i got to kind of you can just retry it, right? Yeah. Once fixing it, you can retry the run. That's it, right? So this issue won't be happening next. If you are fixing that keyboard, you can uh, configure the simulators like that. Always there will be soft keyboard present over there. You can specifically go to the hardware and you can just connect to that corresponding so, uh, so, uh, keyboard. So every time when you run the simulator, simula uh, the keyboard will be appearing on that simulator. I have faced this issue. So just fixed with that one. But, uh, but it may happen if you are using a new simulator. If you're going to use a new simulator, then you need to fix this. It's just like you just added a new test device to your inventory. You need to make sure that everything works fine on that particular device before we enable the test. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, Uh, yes, obviously yes, because the concept is same for Appium. So how it's going to check whether, uh, so let's say you have given uh, uh, a device name as uh, iPhone 8 and a version as um, 12.0 or something like that. And uh, there is only one simulator available in your machine. So maybe not a simulator, it's a real device. And on maybe someone accidentally upgraded it to uh, another version. So what happens is that uh, Appium may not be finding out that particular device and it will throw the exception. So all these things you need to make sure that whatever you are requesting, it should be available in our infrastructure. You need to make sure that it won't create a new iPhone for you, right? It will be amazing if, it, if working something like that. <laughs> That's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.